Hot dog. Avast me hearties and welcome once again to full stream ahead. I be your captain, Charlie, the Professor Esser. And with me, as always, is me first mate and skinny rich friend. It's Maz. Welcome, Maz, once again to full stream ahead in a world of capes and lunatics, of gods and gamma monsters. Sometimes you need a lawyer. And in those times, you need She-Hulk, attorney at law. Welcome once again, season one, episode one, a normal amount of rage from She-Hulk, er, uh, attorney at law. Jen Walters' world is turned upside down after a freak accident leaves her with superpowers. Our writers this week are Jessica. Yeah, it's my little uh, Christopher Walken there. Uh, Jessica ah. Gao created this all for television. Stan Lee created the She Hulk with John Buscema. Um. Meanwhile, uh, let's see here. Cut Corio Cor, Coro C O I R O. Cut Coro. Uh, did our directing this week. Uh. Jennifer Ga Jessica Gao, sorry, Jessica Gao actually wrote this. Um, the Hulk was actually created by Stanley and Jack Kirby. And hardest working two people in show business this week, uh, Maz, it's Dana Schwartz and Cody Ziglar. Mm. Um, yes. Uh, Jennifer's Walters' his world is in fact turned upside down. And what can that mean for the Marvel? Uh, Mar Marvel Cinematic Universe, Maz. I think a uh, lot. Lots of destruction. Usually, mm -hmm. lots of destruction. So, uh, so let's just give us. So we get the introduction. We get a very interesting take on the great power has great responsibility speech in the fact that those with the with, uh, with great power also comes great accountability, which is a different twist on it. As we're talking about good old Roxon, well, we assume it's Roxon. We assume that, you know, when it comes to evil corporations, hmm. it's usually Roxon. It's like how LexCorp is usually the evil right. corporation. I mean, yes, it could be Stain or, or one of the other groups, it could be Hammer, but we can probably assume it's Roxon. Um, and uh, in this moment, she is preparing for her um, presentation, her closing arguments. Um, even as her her well-meaning uh, male lawyer friend, um, where is it? Where is he? Uh, yes, um, Drew Matthews, Dennis Bukowski, just tries to explain to her how this would come so much better coming from a man. Um, did he say coming from a man, or did he say coming from me? He said coming from me. He okay. meant coming from him. And um, I'm just wondering, I mean, like, just to, you know. Yeah, just to play devil's advocate. Not, right. Would he do the same thing if there was a guy in, in her position? Uh, I'm not sure he would. I mean, he could just, I mean, honestly, he could just be a guy who just always wants to do the closing argument. He could say, I mean, that's, that, yeah. that's lawyers, right? He, yeah. They're all trying to make their case to be considered for a promotion or for a partnership or whatever. Yeah. And so, like, I mean, I, yeah, they're painting it that way. But I'm just saying, like, we don't, yeah, we don't, yeah. we can't. You know, it's kind of like Thor when he said he should be the one to do the snap to bring everyone back. Mm. And there's a certain level of it where you can see Thor's point. It's like, yeah, everyone else sees him as fat Thor, but he's still freaking Thor. He's right. still freaking and, and the he's god been of thunder. Thor for thousands of years. Yeah. Like he's been Thor for two months. Yeah, exactly. And so it's like, you know, you you can see his point, but you can also see the other person's point, especially Banner's point about how the energy is gamma. Mm. And it is something that he is more 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 set to metabolize as we see in this episode right so so um, i mean like it's an interesting thought like his his blood is actually producing gamma so if his blood falls anywhere that's not prepared to handle gamma radiation it's going to destroy it right yeah i mean well that that seems to be the implication here i mean it's interesting how it all works out because there there's a lot i mean there's a lot to unpack with everything they say about 
the use of gamma and all that kind of stuff and how how uh their bodies their bodies uh process gamma presumably differently but not necessarily inefficiently than other beings and we're going to get to that because there's a there's a, actually there's a whole deeper level i mean honestly if you're a big comics nerd like i am there are so many levels onto this starting with the accident now as is said this is a sicarian messenger craft okay and that is what the hulk calls it that is what everyone on youtube called it i don't know if it is because again as i said it has a very distinctive purple and gold paint style rather than the red and blue paint styles that the previous sicarian crafts you've seen have um is purple and gold is that what like wakandan no the purple and gold is the leader well who's the leader uh, who are they? No, the leader is Samuel Stearns, uh, the guy who, similar to Jen, got a little bit of Hulk blood in his head and suddenly uh, had a Hulk brain. Um, in the comic books, he just got exposed to a huge amount of gamma radiation and got super smart, you know, because huh. he was kind of a dumb guy. Well, and it's interesting how his story has evolved over the years, because originally he was just, you know, a dumb janitor who got exposed to gamma radiation and then he then whereas bruce banner who was a super smart guy got super strong this guy got super smart Mm. so that's their basic dichotomy now since then basically what they've established with stearns is that he was actually a neurodivergent person what does that mean exactly no it's like uh, autism but basically Uh it's like you know so basically everyone thought he was dumb because he had a hard time communicating and working things, but at the same time, his brain could always solve these very complex puzzles. This is then this is all retcons, but this is effectively who Sam, Samuel Stearns' character is. Because is it kind of like the bifurcated mind in a way that is that what like yes. the, the uh, syntax means? Sort of like the fact yes. that the brain is, is going in two different directions. It's well, no, like- actually, what it means is like so. There's a there's a mean of of neurotypical behavior. Uh-huh. And then there's neuro neuro neurodivergent behavior. Oh, so it's not like two. It's 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 just bent. Yeah, in, in a, it's like uh, like fork. most people That's think. Most people think you know. It's like it's like it's as an example. Most cultures read right to left. Every so often, you're going to find a culture that reads left to right, top to bottom, bottom to top. You know that there's going to be some other way that they organize their communication process. And it's it's not it's not good or bad. It's just divergent. It's a different take on it. Gotcha, 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 gotcha. gotcha. So that, but that is who the leader is, and honestly, that all fits into very much the leader we've seen in the MCU already. Um, and this one, he's not a janitor. He actually is a noted biochemist, but he may still have all kinds of quirks and difficulties being outside of um, the academic environment. Like when he's dealing with the thing he's good at, he's good at it. And outside of that, it's all a bit more complex. Mm. So anyway, but but this is and this goes into this whole larger canonical thing. But here's the one thing that kind of hits me on it. When uh, Jennifer and Bruce are talking after the fact, and Bruce says, "Oh yeah, that was a Sicarian messenger class vehicle. I should probably see what they were, what they were on about." And the thing about it is, is this is a spaceship that almost killed you and your cousin. And let's be clear, had the inhibitor not malfunctioned, Bruce would be dead. Had uh, Jen not gotten Hulk blood in her, she would be dead. This was a near death experience. Because like before the Hulkening... She mm-hmm. seemed to walk out of the truck like, but she had cuts in her arms. Shape, she had cuts in her arms. I know, but like, I mean, I, I think she probably would have been all right without the whole blood. Mm. It's a possibility, but I'm saying, first of all, I'm saying Bruce doesn't know that, right? And from Bruce's perspective, he may be thinking of it he, like 
the fact, and here's what, what it actually gets down to. So the character of Smart Hulk gets a lot of uh, relations to the Professor Hulk, which was something that was created uh, effectively by um, the ringmaster of the Circus of Crime. And alongside, um, uh, what's his name? Um, Doc Sampson. Um, Leonard Sampson, who was who was played by uh, Ty Burrell in the previous Hulk film. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I know. There's a lot of layers on this. Anyway. So anyway, but what it was was it was a Hulk with Banner's mind, but in order to function, he had to sort of effectively be separated from his more heavy emotions. And there's a whole plot line in this, which is that in that storyline, Blonsky, Emil Blonsky, winds up killing um, killing Bet, uh, Betty Ross, mm-hmm. Banner's wife, and then Professor Hulk effectively forgives him. And this comes back later because, as it turns out, he says, but Professor Hulk wasn't really Banner. It was cut off from my emotions, right, right. so he, I he, couldn't the actually feel it. Wasn't his to give. Exactly, and effectively, what it what the establishment of it all is is that effectively, Professor Hulk eventually becomes a maestro, which is the evil Hulk that uh, is from the future imperfect line. Who, after all the hero heroes die in a nuclear holocaust, he takes over the world. And is effectively an uh, omnipotent dictator. Mm. You know, he keeps everybody in the, on, on the planet under his control. Well, what few humans are left, and he's just the, the ruler of the world. That's the premise. Um, which is why, incidentally, I think for everyone that wants to do a Planet Hulk, I don't think they're going to do that when they do a Hulk movie, if they do a Hulk movie. If they do a Hulk movie, it will be Future Imperfect by John Byrne. And that is going to be banner meeting his future self who Mm. is the natural progression of the smart hulk to an evil dictator who rules the who rules the planet anyway that sounds fun too oh it's a lot of fun but let's get into the actual story and what we actually got so 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 to to get that point like so hulk skin can't be permeated but banner skin can so he got cut while he was banner yeah. And because the thing was tamping down on his hulkness, he stayed banner. And yeah. that's why yeah. he didn't hulk out. Well, he eventually hulked up because it was damaged. And effectively what happens is but the he got hulk, cut first. He got cut first, which caused the blood to start to hulk, which caused the hulk blood to go into Jen and yada 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 yada. Um now what's interesting about this is is, is and again, Hulk's skin can be permeated. But you need something like vibranium, adamantium, etc., to actually damage the Hulk skin. Adamantium can hurt Hulk skin. Oh yeah, very easy. That's why that's why he's always paired up against Wolverine. I always wondered. I was like, man, I wonder how that would because like you can't put so it would just be like just beating him uh, consistently for like three days while he's dazed. Uh, you know, like I don't know. <laughs> well, no, I mean, because the reality is that when when uh wolverine like cuts the hulk it's just like cutting anybody else because the adamantium just goes through him like butter really? And really yeah and so like when they fight and in fact and in fact it has later been retconned into the concept that the reason why these two fight all the time is because that's the only way they can gather hulk blood <laughs> and so every time they fight, you know, Wolverine's just cutting the heck He's out of like the Hulk. Wringing the Hulk. out his costume yeah. afterwards. Well, no, but like on everything, and they just go scrape off the Hulk blood. Now they've just got this constant supply of Hulk blood. This, I mean, oh, this is the thing. Hilarious. All of this stuff that <laughs> built into that first Hulk, that built into this, this is all stuff that they visited in the comics not too long ago. Mm. And so there is a real progression to what could happen with it. You tie into that the other idea of their event of the of that maybe the real threat in this is the intelligentsia. 
then suddenly you could get a lot more. You might even get a Wolverine in this. You don't know yet. Or somebody else who has a vibranium or adamantium weapon, you know, mm. who could really cause damage to the Hulk. And you can get see people collecting that blood. Because in mm. the end, it's all about the blood, which they even make a point of in this when after Banner has run the tests on Jen's blood, he vaporizes it. Because he knows how dangerous that little bit of blood is. Because maybe he's already met the leader. Maybe he already knows what a little bit of Hulk blood can do. Yeah, and yeah. God forbid, like some tiny beetle gets into some Hulk blood, drinks that. <laughs> you don't even want to know. That's how you get spider hams. Um, <laughs> irradiate that spider, it bites a pig, suddenly you have a spider ham. Oh, um, boy. Oh, boy. Um, <laughs> I'll tell you what I liked about this show. Right off the bat, they set the tone for the kind of show they wanted you to be. She breaks the third wall right away, and she goes, listen, I know you. You're not going to pay attention until I give it. So here it is. And I'm like, I appreciated that. I was like, okay, yeah, yeah. I know me too, and I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, so uh, right off the bat, it's it's. Uh, I didn't think it was going to be as much of a comedy kind of thing, but but it's enjoyable. They don't take themselves too seriously. Um and, and, and I really dig, dug that about it. Yeah, I mean, I like the I like the comedy. I like that. And here's what I'll say: I think that we're going to get the comedy, but I don't think it's going to be just comedy. I think right. that it like it's it, this is the opener. This is the get your foot right, and it's in its own way, it's kind of like when you saw Wandavision, and it's opening up, and it's just this little. 50s sitcom, you know, ding, ding. Although ding, ding, WandaVision ding, ding, ding. was, in my opinion, the exact opposite of what they did. Mm-hmm. They sort of, we're just going to do this high, you know, art, hoity-toity thing, and you'll either come along or you'll come along because we know you're going to come along. So, mm-hmm. like, here, they're more just like, okay, come on, we're just going to have some fun. You know, it's like, I'm not going to, yeah. you know, so, like, they're setting the tone. We're not going to be so deep into like whatever it's gonna be a fun show get ready to have a good time and, and that's what it said to me and i was like i dig it i'm here for it yeah and and i can see that too i can see definitely that there is i mean there's definitely the levity there's definitely this desire to be there's a desire to look at how ridiculous superheroes can be you, well you what know? i mean i think what i find interesting about that is they're they're saying not just that there'll be levity in the show but their relationship with us will have a measure of levity. We will relate to each other in a tongue-in-cheek kind of happy-go-lucky yes, kind of yeah. fun way. Um, and that's what I think I appreciated about that. Yeah, and no, and I get that, and I absolutely get that. I, I guess my, so, and, and partially just because, you know, just a meme I recently saw was, um, and it was from the most recent uh, Ms. Marvel meets Moon Knight issue. And there's just this scene where, you know, uh, so Moon Knight has a fellow uh, disciple of Kanshu called Hunter's Moon, and they like team up together in this. Oh, that's and, why I saw Ms. on Facebook saying Ms. Marvel and her two Moon Dads. Yes, and and okay. and there is there is this thing where you know you know where one says you know he is also a um, you know he is also a fist of Kanshu, and then uh. you know. Uh, uh, Hunter's Moon says the fist of Kanchu, and it's just like, <laughs> yeah, and it is literally just this idea that oh, okay, these two adult superheroes right, are right, going right. to be the teenagers, and me, Ms. Marvel, the teenagers. I guess I got to be the adult in this situation, right? Right, that's you funny. know, and it is, and it is a reality of superheroes at times that they can be silly and petty. And you don't want to think about it, about your best heroes, but like for the ones that are a little bit more out there, yeah, you you'll get these moments. And in this moment, I think that that is a lot of what Jen Walters is approaching, which is like you know, like and this is an interesting thing, especially when they talk about the idea of how you control your anger and how you deal with your anger. And literally, her saying. Bruce, you never had to control your anger the way I have to control my anger, because in truth, you don't fear for your life about your anger. Whereas even if I were to lose my temper, like the worst is I get called a a, a, a B uh, or a C, and or, in the or the best is that that's what happens. Or yeah, or someone freaking knives me. 
Right. And, so, and I really, oh, sorry, sorry to mean to cut you. Go, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Make your point. So what I really dug about that moment was they presented it in a way where it was used as a source of empowerment. It wasn't yes, like, oh, yeah. woe is me or whatever. Like, you know, most of these uh, shows, when they try to be empowering, they end up just, you know, like uh, uh, sort of celebrating the victimhood. Right. That's yeah, the angle yeah. that they take. And it's usually it's rare that you find somebody that does it well in a way that they can talk about serious issues, but make it about empowerment. And I thought like that's the way she took it. You have no idea. Like I'm so and that was her like confidence level. It wasn't like, oh, yes. I've, it was like you have no idea what I how tough I've had to become. Um, so yeah. I thought that was really, really a cool way for them to deal with that. Yeah. And now there is a there is an interesting secondary level to this, which actually also feeds into my smart hulk is professor hulk is maestro theory because of course although not officially established in mcu canon in comic book canon and in the ang lee canon bruce banner was horribly abused his whole life which caused his did similar to what happened with um mark specter so that effectively the Hulk became one of his personas. Mm. And here's an interesting thing, because Jen is the younger cousin, even if people knew that about Banner's father, they probably didn't talk about it much. So Jen might not know what Bruce actually went through. You know, and then of course, and of course Bruce never talks about it. And then this Bruce isn't going to talk about it because again he's separated from his emotions and again then when you get into that whole comparative tragedy question the reality is is that at the end of the day bruce can never bruce can never um really understand jen's because yes bruce went through this trauma but it's a very different trauma right the power and, and the power levels were very different and and it's something that bruce after he separated from his father, it's a scar he carried with him, but it wasn't in his daily day, you know? It's right. it's 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 memory, not not constant. And so it's again, it's at different levels and it's but they it's never a, went there, and that's what I appreciated. It wasn't a competition of tragedies, whatever. It was it was just exactly a competition. she was just sort of like, No, no, you don't understand. I'm a BA, like uh, uh, let me show yes. you. You know, so I thought that was yes. really it never needed to devolve into like that sort of a conversation. And then, you know, I think there's another level on all of this also, which I think um, you kind of get in the subtext, but it's not as, uh, I mean, maybe it is obvious because I got it, but which is the fact that Banner's really lonely, you know, and this is the first time he ever had anyone where he felt a connection, which is ironic because it's like one of these things where I think that if he and Emil, met and could just like uh, put all the trouble aside they might become best buddies i mean i could just a crazy though <laughs> it's a little crazy but you know what i could no, emil's a little crazy he's a little ambitious yeah. i don't know if, no, no, uh, no. and and Hulk is, he's a pretty zen dude you know i know but what i'm saying is i could absolutely see and uh, like if they go full comedy there will be a scene of abomination and hulk running mm. down the beach as they play People, let me tell you about my best friend. <laughs> Which, of course, is meta on three levels for those who know about, you know, one of Bill Bixby's earlier sitcoms. You know, <laughs> just the idea of, you know, that these two might meet. And it's like, okay, we're not going to fight, but let's just talk. I was like, yeah, man, I know what you mean. It's rough being a freaking gamma monster all the time. You know? <laughs> and that would make for an interesting thing. So, that, so yeah. that's my that, that's my big prediction for a fun, maybe episode five kind of thing. You get that Banner Blonsky meeting where they just mm. sort of start talking. They talk through their trouble, and then the next scene is just them on the beach in, in Cancun, just yeah. playing in the surf. You know, so like a Rocky and Apollo thing when they're playing in the surf. You know, um, I could see that. I could absolutely see that. I think that'd be great. That would be great. Um, though it's not, it's not Banner's show. It's She-Hulk's show. Right. Um, 
But you know, we have all of this Hulk lore that we're looking at, which is why I have to know about leader. I really want, because we see that there's some kind of a group meeting for, uh, we're assuming Gamma mutates that Blonsky's at. I want to see that run by Ty Burrell. Hmm. I want to see Doc Sampson actually there running the meetings as as Ty Burrell, Doc Sampson, you know, just doing the psychological breakdowns on all of these superpowered beings. I mean, that's that's just a gimme in this. Like these are the these are these Easter eggs. They aren't even really Easter eggs. These are like important plot points that could make it for a great thing. Hmm. Um, Do you know how many episodes we're gonna get of this thing? We're supposed to get nine. Hey, all right. Yeah, so it's got a it's got a good long order. I mean, I think a lot of them are like thirty minute bits, but that's still. Yeah. I'm not complaining. Because, you know, like at one point she's like, "Okay, lawyer show." And now that I'm sitting there thinking about the end of the episode, like, what is it going to mean for her closing arguments? What is it going to mean for the, how everybody else sees her? Was the idea of civic responsibility displayed in her actions enough to inspire the jury to say, hey, you know what? She's right. Or is it going to ruin her career? And then I start thinking about like, man, it would be an interesting show if like it just every week we got a new case that she has to try or something like that. I was like, maybe yeah. I am. Yeah. Like, I think I'm, I'm, I'm down for a lawyer show too. Yeah. Uh, I wouldn't be I wouldn't be mad at an episode where she doesn't hawk out and she does control herself and she gets through a case and gets it done. That would be a really fun watch. Well, you know, and what's interesting, so, and of course, for those, you know, I mean, obviously there's a lot out there and the premise of the next scene, because of course this whole, this whole premise is that, you know, she's been, um, you know, that she's going up against a uh, Goodman Lieber, um, what was it, Goodman Lieber, uh, Kurtzberg and, and Book, um, which is the, the, the other law firm um of course named after the the like three big names in marvel comics in the early days um mm -hmm. and the idea is is that in this moment um she is she gets recruited by them because they want to open up their superhuman law division so she's going to be the one that's defending the super villains because that's that's who tends to hire lawyers is yeah, super villains. I, I, I'm, I'm here for that show that show sounds yeah interesting. And there's lots of good you can do with it. Lots of very interesting plot lines you can explore with yeah. it. And, um, you know, but I also like the idea that is, which has been put out there that basically Titania shows up. Who's Titania? That's the lady that bursts through the wall at the very oh. end of it. And I think that's another person that we're going to actually get sort of a rapidly evolving story with. Because huh. she is she hulk's arch enemy but i think they're uh, gonna very quickly become best friends it seemed to me like she was like a jobber in the wwf you know like when the brooklyn yes. brawler came out to take a whooping from somebody to make a name for themselves yes. you know? that's what it felt like well, yes but here's what's interesting okay so like and uh, like i'm sure more people aren't talking about but maybe everyone else saw what i saw she has a flying sidekick mm. which is a very showy move Hmm. The problem is, is that it's also a very dangerous move because unless you hit it square, that's very easy for someone to catch you, which she hope does, punch you in the sternum, and now you've just added her force to your force. Because we see that she Hulk takes off her shoes, hits her square, and that's what knocks her back and, you know, knocks her out. Um, and the idea being that Titania doesn't really have... Uh, the training as a fighter. That, and she thought she was going to be beaten up on, uh, you know, like crusty lawyers. And all of a sudden, Someone, the superhero yeah. shows up. You know, I mean, like, she wait, definitely I got before. caught off guard because she says, right. you. you know, <laughs> they wait a second, the superheroes here too? Like, what are you doing here? <laughs> so I think there's a, I, so I think her being a jobber definitely is a very real possibility. And hmm. as it pointed out to me by some friends, there was another Titania who was an unlimited class wrestler alongside Screaming Mimi, who eventually becomes Songbird, who is one of the founding members of the Thunderbolts. So, yeah. Wow. 
there are layers upon layers of this and I, I this is why this show is so exciting this is why every first episode is exciting i would almost feel bad to be one of these people who's famous enough that you get like the first three episodes mm. to watch and review because yes you're going to get a lot more and it's probably going to be great but you're going to miss out this real just joyful right you know what it could be yeah yeah the what if arguments amongst friends those are great those are always fantastic all right um uh any extra thoughts about tonight's episode Maz? uh where did we end this where does this one and then we got a secret post credit scene too right oh well yes we got the we we got the star lord parentage um uh thing because okay so here's the thing so the post credit scene is whether or not steve rogers Ah, uh, yes, yes. had sex. Right, 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 right. Which, and again, <laughs> it is a huge leap to say that in the years after he reconnects with Peggy that they never had sex. Right. That is just a huge effing leap. Yeah. You know, that because they were together for like a year or two. You know, it, yeah, they're running around a lot, but they clearly had time to sit in a bar at some point and have a drink. Like her, he, she and Pe- he and Peggy definitely went on a couple of dates in that, you know. Yeah. So just the idea that yeah, he probably stripped Peggy Carter at some point. Um, that makes sense. What is a little interesting is that what the Hulk says, what Banner says, is he lost it to a girl when he was on tour with the USO show in 1943. And what's interesting about that is that it doesn't say one of the dancers. It just says a girl he met on the USO tour in 1943. Yeah. Well, there's this very famous scene where there's a woman he meets who shares a very longing glance with him. And he kind of like, how are you doing? Hmm. And that actress went on to play Meredith Quill. Who is? Star-Lord's mom. Aha. Now, the timeline doesn't work out for that to be Star-Lord's mom. But right, it does work out. Star-Lord. Yeah. It could be Star-Lord's grandmom. And either her son or her daughter was Star-Lord's mom. Just like there's that generation move with Ms. Marvel. That mm. little bit of space between the super soldier and the celestial gets you that unlocking of the secret powers. Aha. So assuming that there is some deeper story that is in the lore that's hidden in all the secret legends, that could be that. That's why Star-Lord could actually awaken the celestial spark because he had that little bit of vita ray left over from Steve Rogers from when his mom got when his grandmom got knocked up. Hooray for oh. unprotected sex. Um, <laughs> 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 well, you know uh, it was the 40s. They actually were well, well aware of condoms and Steve should have used a condom, but you know, if he didn't, the universe might not have been saved. We don't know that he did or didn't, but he probably did. We don't know. We don't know. Yeah. Uh, I can say that definitely the the young lady, um, and that's what I'll say. That's the thing about Steve. I always make this point. Steve has had a lot of girlfriends over the years, and he has definitely had sex with a lot of them. Not a one of them, not a one of them is ever like, oh, Steve, you awful cad. They're all like, Oh, that's Steve. You know, it's yeah. like whatever he did, he did it right. And he was probably a real gentleman <laughs> about everything. It's sort of like, um, what's his name? I think, uh, uh, Casanova. Don Juan's the fictional one. Casanova is the actual guy who's an actual guy. And, um, you know, Casanova, he would just, he was just such a sweetheart as he was just betting all these women of Europe that no one ever really like there's no like real story of like the person who felt horribly wronged by Casanova. There was right. like, no, he was very upfront about everything. He was real sweet and really kind and a very generous lover. And 
you know, <clears throat> then you moved on. And quite frankly, yeah, you know, that superhero lifestyle, that's not really what I wanted for me, you know. Right. But it's Some a good, people are it's, just a gift to the world, you know. Yeah, you know, it's a good notch to have on your bedpost. Yeah, it's plenty to share. <laughs> anyway, so that's that is that is that story. That is the Steve Roger. Steve Rogers did have sex probably many times with at least two women we know of. Because again, you're not going to tell me he didn't have sex with Peggy Carter. These were, these were, right. you know, freaking, that's it's not, the that's 40s. That's not a world I want to live in. Yeah, you're in the middle of war. You're not going to have sex. You're not going to do it for America, the red, white, and the blue. Come on. You, we could die tomorrow. Right. You know, but either one of them. Don't you want to have something extra to fight to come back for, you know? Exactly. Anyway. <laughs> it's one of my favorite uh, lines from Greece, too, is do it for America, the red, white, and the blue. Um, oh, good boy. Uh, okay, moving right along. Uh, yeah, so that was that episode. Uh, Post-credits and all. Yeah. I hope we didn't forfend the delicate uh, sensibilities of our listeners. <laughs> uh, Maz, uh, well, actually, first off, before you tell us where we can reach you, let me tell you a little bit about Capes and Lunatics, how people can give us money. Oh, boy. Because you know what, Maz? I do like money. And before you give us the money, you can tell us anything you want to know about us, about what we talk about here. And you can write to us at Capes and Lunatics, all spelled out, all one word, at gmail.com. Write us a letter. We will read it on the air, either for this show or any of the other shows in the Panoply of shows we have on Capes and Lunatics. You can also, if you don't like to write, but you just want to give that passion of the of your voice to one of the topics we discuss, you can call us at 614-382-2737. That's 614-38-CAPES. If you don't know which show you want to talk about, why don't you go to our link tree in our show notes, go to linktr.ee dot ee slash capes and lunatics. Go there. You're going to see all of our shows. You can see what we're about to do, what we have done, and you can tell us what your thoughts are. And while you're there, if you like what we do, why don't you give us some money? You can either buy delightful items like our real aluminum mugs, keep your cold drinks cold all night long, or your hot ones in the morning, if that's your preference. Uh, you can get wonderful t-shirts that we sell and many other delightful uh, products. Or if you don't want a product, but just want to show your love, subscribe to our Patreon. Uh, if you give $5 a month, you will get full video uh, and the ability to vote on our movies and choices and questions that we put to you, our viewers. Uh, like, what is the worst superhero movie of all time next week league of extraordinary gentlemen versus uh uh what was the other one was it spawn mm. now i'm blanking on which one it is but i know league of extraordinary gentlemen's on there um, it wasn't bad i, I enjoyed that i movie like one. league of extraordinary gentlemen don't get me wrong but man i'm blanking on the other show but anyway we'll know but but if you listen to our other shows you'll find out and you can subscribe to our Patreon and see it. Actually, you watch the review and let us know what you think was the worst of the two shows. And Maz, if people would just like to talk to you about something else absolutely free, how can they find you? Oh, they can email me at mazmanzora at gmail.com or find me on Facebook under Maz Manzora. That's M-O-Z-Z-M-A-N-Z-O-O-R. And of course, you can always write to me in that old fashioned email, whether we're mothers and fathers, one sit at superconnectivityblog at gmail.com. That's superconnectivityblog, all one word at gmail.com. And of course, follow me on the Twitter as I live tweet things when I feel like it, like Stargirl, unless I've already missed it, at Charlie Esser. That's C H A R L I E E S S E R. Look for the two E's in the middle. Quality. Thank you, Maz. All right, me hearties, you have come through another episode and listened to our wonderful tales of our gamma-infused goddess, the She-Hulk. Tune in again next week when we once again sail full stream ahead. Arrgh. Yes. I, I don't know, my thing was so low today. I, I just came out low. I was like, wait, that didn't make any sound at all. Ping. Okay, I was there like, we whispering go. that ping, I don't know. <laughs> Part of Anyways. me really wants to end on the old Gamma Cast ending. 
This is cool. <laughs> yeah, I think we should. We I should kind of figure out how to get Gamma Cast in here. Cause yeah, yeah. You yeah, remember yeah. the Gamma Cast, Miles? Oh, man. Those were the days. Those, those were, were fun. Days. Those were really fun. Yes. So tune in next week as we once again sail full stream ahead on the Gamma Cast. <laughs> yes. Right on. All right, Part man. Of a threat, though. Okay, <laughs> well, yeah. I will talk to you. <laughs> Luckily, you I only have to be once a week. Yes, I will talk to you next week, Maz. Have a good one, man.